not all of them, but most of them, um, while the Assyrians shipped in a whole bunch of whoever they wanted to from anywhere else they wanted to, and we saw kind of this mix. This is the full-on pagan. These are Roman guys. The Italian regiment were guys that were supposed to be among the most loyal, and they are god fears. What we have, essentially, is a religious man getting about as close to Judaism as you can, works-wise, and with his heart, but not being a full proselyte. He did not fully convert to Judaism, and he was not allowed into the temple or into the synagogue for worship or sacrifice. But we do see him living to the light that he has been given. What's interesting is we just... We see a sinner seeking God, and we see a seeking Savior finding that seeking individual. Kind of an amazing concept. And he was quite the notable individual. So we have these um, regiments comprising roughly of 4,500 to about 6,000 men stationed all over the place. Each of these regiments are broke down into cohorts, which are about 600 men strong. So a cohort being 600 men, and a centurion being in charge of hundred people there's only six of these guys wandering around this place at this time and we see the text really focusing towards his works and it's important to note that it's not the works that is saving this individual we still see the word is going to be sent to Cornelius what's interesting is the difference Cornelius is a religious man. Typically, when we see the concept of the religious man in the Word, what is the character like of the religious individual? It's generally not a good thing. What we discussed Friday night at our Revelation Home series in chapter 3, and we've seen it more than once, is the synagogue of Satan. We say that they're Jews and are not. Discussing in context, more to the point, the Jewish religious leaders. Supposed to be the holiest of the men in the history of forever because they kept the strictest codes of the law all the way down to the letter. But they really didn't. We see them doing what they can, implementing their own little laws or rules to try and circumvent the law. They believe that if you were very prosperous, you were blessed by God. But if you were poor, you were cursed by God, and we see them breaking all manner of rules, and what we used on Friday night was just the trial of Jesus. You can use the trial of Stephen that we talked about in chapter 7 of the book of Acts. They hired false witnesses. They had um, the trial by night. They had it in secret. They had it at a time they weren't supposed to. We see the high priest tearing their clothes. We, so we typically see a, a, an ill nature in the religious man, but one of the big differences between Cornelius and the general religious man is he knew. He knew that he couldn't be saved by his works alone, but he didn't know the rest of the process. So we see him praying to God, having this vision, and in verse 4, him being kind of the military man, which is just neat, considering it, we don't have anywhere in the text he ever had any other kind of meeting, he quickly responds with, yes, Lord, and then he quickly responds in obedience with sending men 30 miles south to Joppa, like Caesarea, another coastal town. So we see him being sincere and still not being saved. Always bringing us back to that place of it's not of works. So the angel tells him to send men. We see... God in this preparation stage working at two different ends don't we we see him working on Cornelius his household and the things that are going on around Cornelius but we're also going to see him working on Peter what's interesting is Cornelius is to send men 30 miles 30 miles south from Caesarea to Joppa to go get Peter. Who else was in Caesarea at this point in time? Who do we leave off with? 
<clears throat> Philip. Philip was snatched away from the Ethiopian down at the deserted place. And we see Philip making his way to Caesarea. But we're not going to see Philip being used. At least not in immediate text. He's being sent for Peter. I really like how not only is God always pursuing that sinner, pursuing that seeking sinner, but he's always still working on the heart of the believer. Peter still has a little bit of walls up. We can see some of those chains coming down. We see him going into Samaria and laying hands on Samaritans. He probably never thought he was going to do that. The last time he was in Samaria, what happened? <laughs> a couple of brothers got a nickname, Sons of Thunder, because they weren't welcome in Samaria. So James and John said, well, should we pray and let fire come down from heaven and just destroy him? That was their response to the situation. So you can imagine the shock that Peter had going to this area and laying hands. As we closed up with chapter 9 two weeks ago, we see Peter staying with a tanner. And that was not a favored profession for these individuals. They're always touching dead animals. So what does that mean? That whoever the tanner was, was always defiled. So if you are consistently defiled, you're not allowed in the temple. You're not allowed at synagogue. In fact, you had to live, I think it was 50 cubits away from anybody else because you were unclean. It's almost like choosing to be a leper considering how he had to live. Plus, if anybody's done anything with tanning, especially if you're using older methods to tan hide, oh, it doesn't smell good. It doesn't smell good at all. There's no part of it from start to finish that smells good. Peter was staying with this tanner. You can start to see why it was taking so long to set the stage for the Gentiles to receive the word. We only really ever see the initial part, don't we, of our salvation. Oh, it was the easiest thing in the world. Dude showed up, had a smiling face, a nice suit, kind of a tie. He started telling me about Jesus 30 seconds later. Bam, I was in. Had the ticket, I was a Christian. We see 10 minutes worth of work. But we don't see how long the preparation phase was. Let's just look at the gospel, just the coming of Christ. How long of a preparation phase was that? Not just discussing everything that happened from Genesis all the way up to Malachi, laying all that groundwork, but from Malachi to the birth of Jesus is 400 years. 400 years of prep time to build roads, to improve security in a way for people to get the word out and to come up with a common language that everybody would speak. So 400 years, all this prep time. And we're going to see all this prep work sometimes for one person. Remember reading the story of Philip. Philip was raised up. Philip was faithful. Philip was diligent. Philip ended up getting sent to Samaria. Then Philip had to run from Samaria all the way down to Gaza, then chase down a chariot to reach one Ethiopian guy. That's how important you are. God spends that much time reaching one person. Verse 9, The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour about noon. So while these men are already dispatched, they're already headed south, we just, we see Peter going up to pray. So we can already see kind of how God's working at both ends. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Awesome concept. And we've been seeing it as a pattern as we went through Luke. We saw it as a pattern as we went through Daniel. We're going to see it as a pattern as we continue through Revelation. We've seen it consistently through the book of Acts. When God is doing something, when the Spirit is doing something, the enemy or just your flesh is doing something. Peter's going up to pray, and now Peter is just hungry and he wants to eat. 
He's going up to pray. He feels kind of that desire to pray, but now he feels like he probably should be doing something else. And what's awesome, with every action, there's a reaction. With every reaction, there's a counteraction. What is that counteraction? God's going to use it. In his trance of hunger, God's going to give him a vision of something to eat. Kind of an incredible picture. But we've seen those distractions. What would have happened if Peter had let himself get distracted? And he saw heaven open, and an object like a great sheet bound at four corners. What have we learned from Revelation, or at least some of the beginning portions of Acts, the four corners? or the four winds. We'll continue to see that type. It means from the four corners of the globe, from all over the place. Descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. All this stuff in a great big sheet is being lowered down in front of Peter. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. So he's pulling that essentially from Leviticus 11. And there's a great big list of all of the fun things that he could and could not eat. And now is a sheet coming down in front of him with a voice that he ascribes to the Lord saying, Arise, kill, and eat. What does he do? He goes back to those teachings of the law, which is good to go back to the word in a general sense. But then he also says, not so, Lord. No is a fantastic answer. Lord is a fantastic response. No Lord or no master or no king is not a fantastic response. Those shouldn't even be in the same sentence. And yet we do it. We pray or we sing some of the worship we had this morning. You know, Lord, it's your will, not my will. So when it's something the Lord wills, it's, mm, I'm not going to do that today. It's too hard or too far or too crazy, too scary, too something that's just going to rub us the wrong way. But when we do call ourselves bond servants of Christ, servants of Christ or ministers or whatever verbiage we're using and then we're putting no in front of stuff or mixed into our vocabulary it doesn't look right it just doesn't fit and a voice spoke to him again the second time what God has cleansed you must not call common this was done three times And the object was taken up into heaven again. It's Peter. We've all gone through kind of our text with Peter. A lot of us, most of the time, are a lot like Peter. Any of you, or anything like me, I always learn things the hard way. Or it just takes longer for me to really catch on to the concept. We see Peter, how many times did he put his foot in his mouth through the gospel? Peter hasn't quite caught on yet what the Lord is doing with the Gentiles, even though he was warned. But we're still going to see Peter, later on in the text, being rebuked by Paul, because Peter moved away from eating with the Gentiles because those of the circumcision didn't like it. And we see Paul kind of rebuking Peter for it. It was done three times. Why was it done three times? Probably for Peter to recognize the gravity of the situation. Peter denied Christ three times. After the resurrection at the shore, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? So this is probably a reference back to that, showing Peter exactly what the heart of God is for the situation that's going to take place. Verse 17, now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gates. How awesome. God's timing, naturally, just better than our timing. So while he's on the roof praying, you have to remember this is 10 years from Pentecost. 
So there's still people persecuting the church. So now he looks over the wall, and he's got a Roman dude. They're knocking on the door, looking for Peter. You can imagine what's going through his mind right now. The hair just kind of standing up on the back of his neck. While he's trying to ponder this dream, he hasn't eaten yet, so he's got that problem. And we, again, anything like myself, you get kind of hangry. If you don't get that hot dog or that hamburger, you just kind of start slipping in that place of just downright not niceness. And now there's a Roman guy knocking on the door looking for him. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging here. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. God sees all things. Those things that are worrying us. We see Peter because he has um, that fellowship with the Spirit. We see the Spirit speaking to Peter. Dude, stop freaking out. Behold. Gaze at intently. Pay attention to the concept. There are three people here seeking you. I don't know how better that would have made Peter feel, but at least now he is aware that God's hand is in the situation. Arise, therefore, go down with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. There's two general interpretations to doubting nothing. The first one, which would generally seem obvious, is they're not spies. They're not here to arrest you. They're not here to burn down Simon's house. But what we see in the rest of the text and in the literal rendering of that sentence is making no distinction. So that, those words doubting nothing means to make no distinction. In Galatians 3.28, we see one of, one of the many amazing things that the cross had done. In fact, we're going to turn over there and we're going to read it. And you're going to watch me turn over there because I didn't mark it. Galatians 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. The cross brought down all of those barriers. All of the cultural um, class divided, racial barriers, the cross tore all of those down. There was not supposed to be any of those divisions within the body. When Peter saw this vision of the sheet coming down, he says, what I have called clean, speaking about the Gentiles, you will not call unclean. Because the common thought was, if you're a Gentile, at least according to the Jews, you were the equivalent to a dog. In fact, one of their normal prayers from the Jewish males, they were glad they were born a Jewish male, not a woman or a Gentile or a dog. Harsh. <laughs> and now we see the Spirit telling Peter to make no distinction. You are going to go with these men, though they are Gentiles, you're going to go with them just like they were Jews those walls being torn down. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion. So you can already see the, the, where the conversation is going. These men, who are likely also God-fearers, probably not Jews, they're starting off with Cornelius the Centurion. Where does that put Cornelius? In like a scale of 1 to 10. You know, here's the guy that scrubs cars. Here's the Centurion. You can already see what they're trying to do to get Peter to come with them. Peter, no doubt, was known in a ton of regions by this time. Peter, with Jesus, and the rest of the disciples were in that region. They don't know what to expect. When we're trying to introduce somebody, do we introduce them on a good foot or a bad foot? This is my buddy. Known him all my life. Great buddy. This is John. He drives a Mercedes. He's the CEO of the... And I was like, oh, 
I want to meet that guy. Granted, this is Baker City, so I guess the better way to introduce somebody is, hey, this is John. He kills an elk every single year. He can find him with his eyes closed. Oh, good, let's go meet John. <laughs> Nobody wants to introduce their friend as, hey, this is John. I've known him a little bit. He's kind of a dirtbag. <laughs> Y'all want to go to breakfast together? Mm, no, thanks. I will pass. Is there anybody named John in here? All right, we're good. So he's Cornelius the Centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews. That's impressive. If he had such a fantastic reputation between all of the Jews, he probably would have, wouldn't have needed so much of an in-depth introduction by um, the servants that were sent. Was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. So now, not only do we see Peter with Simon the Tanner, but now we see him inviting in three Gentiles and lodging with them. So we can kind of see some of the prep work going into the heart of Peter. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Peter, naturally, is going to take witnesses with him. So now we move from the preparation phase as Peter, the two servants, one devout soldier, and what we'll see is six witnesses are all making their 30-mile trek north from Joppa to Caesarea. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. How awesome is that one? Not an evangelist yet, not a believer yet, and already he's, he's calling, he's inviting people to the situation. That really should go to show that you don't have to be the most biblically literate Bible college seminary super stud student to share the good news with people. Come and see, go and tell. Cornelius haven't even seen yet, and he's already telling people. We all really confuse the gift of evangelism. Is the gift of evangelism actually a gift? Yes, it is. Because the Bible says so. If you don't have the gift of evangelism, what should you do about evangelizing? Evangelize anyway. It is quite a bit that simple. Timothy being left in Ephesus by Paul to pastor Ephesus. Timothy was the pastor, the leader of the church at Ephesus. What else did Paul exhort him to do? Do the work of an evangelism, an evangelist. <laughs> do the work of an evangelist. A lot of people think, well, how is it I'm supposed to do that? Am I just going to wake up one day like Billy Graham? Step up on the stage and just let it fly. No, probably not. If you do, good on you. The Spirit is no doubt with you. Spurgeon was asked about evangelism. He was approached and said, how do I get into the ministry of evangelism? What do I do? Could I come and just stand at the pulpit and just let it fly? The Spurgeon asked the man what he did for a living. He worked on a train. The Spurgeon asked him, well, the guy that's shoveling coal in the train, is he a Christian? The man responded with, I have no idea. He's like, good, start with that guy. Starting with something simple. For us, what does that mean? Well, let's look at the pattern that was laid out for us in Acts chapter 1. They started in Jerusalem, where they were in the immediate. Now go to Judea. So he started spreading out just a little bit more, then to Samaria, then to the ends. My friends, start in your homes. Start in your communities. And you'll just see, if you're faithful in those things, just see what it is that God is going to do. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself and also a man. So we see Cornelius not quite at that point of knowing what he's supposed to do. It's Peter. Peter is an apostle of Christ. So as soon as Peter steps through the door, he falls down and starts worshiping. Love the heart of Peter right here. 
it would have been really easy for Peter to capitalize on the situation. Yeah, that's right, Romans has gone. You can get up now. Peter does not try and come in to establish his authority or superiority in that way. Calling him not to fall down and worship him. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who came together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one, an- to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So we see Peter coming to a place of understanding. He, Peter's explaining probably his standoffishness. We all have those people in our lives. I'm generally one of those people. But I have to explain the weird look on my face. Or my posture, or whatever it is. People are like, dude, what is wrong with you right now? I was asked this morning, why do you look so stoic? I only had one response. You know, I had a baby a week ago. I didn't make it, did I was kind of along for the ride. But I've been on vacation for the last week. The only response I could give is, I don't want to go back to work. I've been at home with Megan and the kids. I've been helping with homeschooling. I've been able to, because we just bought a house like a month ago. We've been working on the house, and it's just been fantastic. Apparently, I just don't like working. (laughs) So I think Peter, for one, is explaining his demeanor. But I would imagine the wall Peter's explaining all of his hot mess Could you imagine what was happening with Cornelius? Salvation is of the Jews. We have a man who is tired of dead religion. False gods that they can't do anything. It would be the equivalent of worshiping a toaster. It can't actually do anything for you. I guess except make your toast. That's probably a bad example. He's had enough. And if you read through the Old Testament... You read through what it is that Cornelius had, maybe he picked up on the concept, because the Jews didn't, that salvation was going to go to the Gentiles eventually. In Jesus' ministry, we see Jesus speaking to the same thing. But what is taught? The salvation is of the Jews. If you're a Gentile, you're doomed. So when he's hearing Peter explain that what God has called clean No man must call unclean. Could you imagine just the the burden that's being lifted off his heart? That he has found something real. In Revelation chapter 3, picking up at verse 7, we see Jesus um, introducing himself to the church of Philadelphia as holy and true. That word true in the book of Revelation, at least in that portion of it, means authentic, the real deal. Especially from a Roman background, all this plethora of all these fake gods to find something real, final, that actually fills you. So you can probably just, just feel how that is uh, removing that burden. Therefore, I came without objection. As soon as I was sent for Here's the fun part. I ask then, for what reason have you sent for me? Doesn't that question kind of seem odd there? Normally when we see a question in the Bible from God or from Jesus, the question is not for God or Jesus. One of my favorite examples is Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve, in their disobedience, they eat from the tree, and now they realize that they're naked, so they try and clothe themselves. Then they hear God's voice, so they hide. God comes through the garden and says, where are you? It's not that God sucks at hide and seek. The question was not for God. The question was for Adam. Why are you hiding from me? Because they chose to. So we see interesting questions. This question here from Peter, it makes me scratch my head is the question for Peter, because he actually doesn't know why he's there, or is the question for Cornelius? Because Peter is wondering why Cornelius thinks that he is there. 
And that might absolutely be the case. Before we baptize anybody, we ask them, do you know why you're here this morning? I n clearly know why you're here. You're here to get baptized. We're both in t-shirts, board shorts, and we're standing in a puddle of water. But do you know why you're here? Do you know why baptism is important? I guess it just depends on how you read it. But it is interesting when you are used to putting up a wall or used to saying not so Lord for so long when God says the real answer is yes you are absolutely confounded by it. I came out of I mean a great many of things but the church I was a part of the longest was the LDS, was Mormonism. So when I left Mormonism I attempted um, a Baptist church, I attempted a Lutheran church but the break wasn't that long before I ended up in the Marine Corps. So really, like, from bad to probably not great to something much worse. In my first tour, I had a great mentor, discipler, who brought me back into the faith, into truth. So I decided, like, well, I need to get baptized. So I went to go see the chaplain, the military chaplain. It's a, it's a military priest. I don't know how to fully express all of that one, but I asked him about baptism, and he asked me what baptism meant. I told him based off of what I was taught. It's the only way to get to heaven. You don't cross any kind of anybody in the military with a stupid answer. Because you always get a stupid response. But now because they're military and an officer, as all chaplains are, basically they can say whatever they want to you because they think it's funny and nobody can stop them. So he basically laughed me out and then sent me to go do a bunch of Bible studies and then yelled at my mentor for sending me over there to get baptized when I didn't know what baptism was. But I took all of this nonsense into my next walk, and it took me a long time to start washing some of that stuff out. Because I spent so long in something broken that I got to a place where I was saying, not so. So then we get corrected, yes, so. We are absolutely confused by it. I don't think that Peter really knew why he was there. Cornelius and all of his responses seemed to know why Peter was there, as we'll continue to get into. So Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and, and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. That's awesome. All of our prayers, you ever talk to somebody and you're like, oh, that guy's not listening to me. So you'll ask a question 10 minutes later, sure enough, he wasn't listening. You feel like no matter what you do, what you say, nothing matters. And that's kind of a drag. But we see everything we do, even the smallest, shortest prayer, remembered by God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now therefore we are all, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. It looks like Cornelius has an idea of what is going on. But we don't look at things from God's perspective. We don't even look at things from Cornelius' perspective. So we'll discuss two kind of avenues that are common today. The first one is one religion is as good as the next one. All religions point to the same place. But typically when we discuss Christianity with anybody, it comes to a very narrow-mindedness. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is fiercely narrow. But the world doesn't like that answer. They want to come to God on their own terms. That's not the way God sees it. The next portion of it that we see now, we as believers have that call to do the work of the evangelist, to take the word out, and it gets met with something pretty sharp. Why don't you just leave Cornelius alone? His religious beliefs 
are part of his culture and you are attacking his culture. How common is that one right now? Also, a lie. Cornelius wanting the truth, having an idea of what the truth is looking like, and we see Peter being sent to do just that. So now on to the proclaiming phase. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, I in... Oh, my goodness. This is what he actually said. In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, no respecters of persons. Going back to that concept of Galatians 3.28, we put up especially our own cultural boundaries, and then we make sure we're stuck by them. One of my big cultural boundaries while I was in the Marine Corps was that I have generally an Irish heritage. Even though there's nothing, I'm, I'm an American. There's nothing really Irish about me. But if I'm going to stick to that boundary in the Marine Corps, one of my key characteristics was how much I drank and how much I fought. If I can't fight somebody else that I don't like, I'm going to fight somebody that I do like. If I can't fight any of those two people, I'll start fighting myself. It's pretty stupid when you say it out loud. But we're going to kind of hang on to some of that one. And we see people hanging on to certain cultural backgrounds that forces them to essentially build a wall between another person. But as a believer, if we're called to reach out to other people, those walls are very foolish. And Peter is making it very to the point. God doesn't give a care, doesn't give a rip about your boundaries that you are setting outside of biblical context. So Paul, sorry, Peter, is speaking to Cornelius and his household. That God is no respecter of persons. So now you can start feeling, or at least sensing how they're feeling, they're coming a little bit closer. We can actually be saved. And just imagine how their countenance has changing. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Not talking about being saved by works. We see these men with the light that they were given pursuing righteousness. That is something that God, like we saw with Cornelius, is going to make sure, is going to send that they get the word. They are sinners seeking a Savior. We have a Savior seeking sinners. We'll continue with the text. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That peace being um, uh, no longer, as it talks about in the book of Romans, no longer enemies or at enmity with God. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Cornelius understands that portion of it. He understands the basic concepts of Judaism. He understands that salvation was going to come from and through the Jews, through Jesus. And he had heard of Jesus through all of these regions. But what was Cornelius' thought towards Christ? Probably like that of any outsider. There was some kind of rebellious Jewish carpenter that went to the cross. But I'm missing the correlation, just like we saw with the Ethiopian, while reading through Isaiah, missing the correlation between Jesus, the fulfillment of the scripture, and what had taken place at the cross. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree kind of working quickly through the gospel. It's that simple. What is Peter telling Cornelius? We were witnesses. That's what it means, to witness, to give testimony. We really like to think that it all boils, we have to memorize cover to cover so we can be an effective witness. But what we've seen so far in the early church, the most effective witness was having somebody who used to be dead 
used to be crippled up, hobbled up, paralyzed, lame, whatever it was, standing in the congregation of men. Who are the dead ones? Who are the crippled, hobbled, lame, blind? It's us. Some of us have got some ferocious testimonies. Not even necessarily being saved out of something awful. You know, talk about, talk about how God had moved you from good to better, from worse to better. You'd be surprised what your testimony can do. That grace that we receive is not just for ourselves, but also to pour into somebody else. We're not as different as we like to think we are. Somebody who has issues with alcohol, odds are there's somebody else who has an issue with alcohol, pornography, drugs, wrath, anger, whatever it is. The people that help me through my drinking or my, for lack of better words, lawlessness, came from the same background. You know what I've noticed the people that aggravate me the most? In all transparency? Are sins I see in one, and they're noticeable in an individual because they're the same ones that I carried around or still stuck in. We were kind of noticed that when that person aggravates me the most because they're doing the same thing that I do. That's the person that we're going to be pouring into. Him, God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. Not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. I like all the extra verbiage. Into the resurrection. We skip that part a lot. Or we assume that Easter just covers it once a year. It doesn't. How amazing it is for us to focus on the resurrection, just like we've seen all of the apostles do. We'll continue to see them do. We'll see Paul hitting it, the resurrection heavy in 1 Corinthians. Because if Jesus came back, we're coming back. We will be a part of the resurrection. I can't think of any better hope than that. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witnessed that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive the remission of sins. That would have definitely lifted the hearts of Cornelius and all of his household. Whoever, whoever believes in him will receive the remission of sins. What is Peter telling Cornelius? Salvation is not just for the Jews. It's not just for the Samaritans, but it is for everybody. While Peter was still speaking, these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Peter is just that apostle that gets cut off. And it's probably for the best. Peter cut him off at the tax booth. Not Peter, Jesus. Jesus cut Peter off at the tax booth. God the Father cut Peter off at the Mount of Transfiguration. He wouldn't stop talking. He's like, oh, it's a good thing to work here, Lord. Let's build everybody little, little, little pillars. And now the Spirit is cutting Peter off. He didn't even get to finish his sermon. They were so thrilled with the fact that they can receive the remission of sins that the Spirit fell on all of the believers, all of the people that were in Cornelius' household while Peter was speaking. Absolutely, Peter, I just imagine, was flabbergasted or upset that the, the sermon he'd been working on for the last 30 miles, he, he got cut off. And those of the, the circumcision, the Jews, who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, or likewise. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered. Not every believer, clearly, is going to speak in tongues. But it is true of every believer that their tongues, that their mouths, will be used to glorify and to magnify God. That being said, why, do, uh, why does the, the household of Cornelius, why are they doing the exact same thing that the apostles did on the day of Pentecost? It was to show Peter and the rest of those with Peter of the circumcision, it was that parallel to Pentecost to show equal standing equal footing. The same salvation that came to the apostles 
is the same that went to the Sumerians, is the same that went to the Gentiles. That the walls are torn down fully. So then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have just received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Important note, one, because a lot of people really argue about it, a lot, what comes first? Baptism, then you receive the Spirit? Or you receive the Spirit, then comes baptism? I always love answering that question. I just tell them both. Because so far in the last ten chapters of the book of Acts, we've seen both. We've seen people receive the Spirit and then be baptized. We saw people get baptized and then receive the Spirit. You remember the Samaritans. They all got baptized. Philip was thrilled. But Philip was not able to lay hands. It was Peter's job. Peter had to go up north into that region to lay hands that they would receive the Spirit. My friends, stop putting God in a box. You will be far less surprised all the time. Odds are you'll stop saying, not so, Lord, so much. Not a guarantee on that last one, but you know it is a shock. We hear it consistently, God always does this, and he does it this way every single time. No, he doesn't. We need to be very careful with how we are trying to do that. Because then we kind of cast off grace, fight more heavily for the concept, our concept of truth, and then we make it religious and legalize it. And then we fight for it earnestly. And then we end up similar to Pharisees or Sadducees, just kind of another dead religious man. We see them not being saved by baptism, but we see baptism as evidence of them being saved. Awesome concept. And I love what happens with the Gentiles afterwards. They asked him to stay a few days. Be a breath of fresh air. One of the key common traits of a believer, especially that of a new believer, is fellowship, being a host, being generous. They wanted fellowship with Peter. They wanted to hear more, especially since he probably got cut off halfway through a sermon. They want Peter to stay, and Peter stayed. How incredible a concept is that? Right now, we are a lot like the early apostles. And we kind of catch ourselves, or a friend catches us and makes sure that they correct us. But we lead off with quite a bit. There's no way that person can be saved. And yet somehow with the same tongue and the same sentence, we can say something like, well, that person just needs Jesus. How are you going to take them, Jesus? And the word, if you've put up a barrier, no one thought that the Sumerians could be saved. Someone in faithfulness went. Faith comes by hearing. They went and they took the word. Saul. It's very likely that a lot of people prayed for Saul. How do you think their prayers look? Oh, Lord, that's a blaspheming individual. Strike him down. Where's them sons of thunder? Send their prayers out. How many people were praying for his salvation? Never tells us in the text. But we see even Paul able to be reached. Someone so zealous and steeped in his own truth, we see Paul being saved. Someone coming out from some of the worst backgrounds, the pantheon of gods that the Romans worshipped were extensive and incredibly dangerous. As we've been going uh, on Friday nights, FYI, Friday night uh, Revelation Home Studies, we've been talking about a lot of the the patron gods of a lot of these cities, like Diana, Artemis, all of these ones that were requiring uh, sexual immorality as a form of worship. The god we just talked about for the church at Philadelphia, their patron god was Dionysius, <laughs> the god of wine. So you can imagine when we're looking at someone steeped in such just weird paganism, just a weird lifestyle, it's like there's no way that person can be saved. That's not our place. Our calling is to do the work of an evangelist. 
if you are not a very good evangelist, flex those muscles. Go to the gym. Nobody wakes up one day and decides they're going to go into a bodybuilding contest. They spend years working at it, working and flexing those muscles, and then they step out. How do we flex ours? By getting out there and doing it. That is the mission of the church. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the text. And thank you, Lord, for showing us who we really are. Through you, God, because of you, all of those barriers are torn down. We are brothers and sisters and fellow heirs, God. Thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us up on equal footing. We don't have to outperform, outshine, outshow, or try and outgrow or outdo anybody else, Lord. But we are called to be that brother and that sister. We are called to be that help and that burden bearer for somebody else. And Lord, as we do step from here, and we do pray, God, that we would continue, that we would be the church of the open door and to take advantage and to seize those opportunities, God, to get you, to get the word out to tell everybody, God, how amazing you are. I pray, Lord, we would be strengthened by your spirit and by your word to do just that, God. To let them know that salvation is for them too. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you for blessing our morning, and we praise you. Amen.